everybody. Hello. Welcome to your last breakout session of the afternoon, or as I like to say, the last event before drinks. Um, so um, because Redbird has deep abiding love for me, they scheduled me in the breakout before drinks and the breakout tomorrow before lunch um, in, a, in, in a sense of motivating me to make sure I finish on time because you might stick around in a breakout when it's not immediately followed by drinks or food. But my two breakouts are followed immediately by drinks and food. So uh, I started a little bit late, but I promise I will not finish late. Um, whether I'm done or not, you're out of here at 5.30. Okay, that's my, that is my commitment to you as a college professor. Okay, so um, we are talking about uh, flight schools in high schools today, really trying to focus on how we increase pathways and opportunities for people uh, before they get to me, for example. Um, I went to college as a first generation and college student, the first person in my family to be a pilot. Um, I was really, really bad in school. Just a show of hands real fast. Like, how many of you considered, were, considered yourself or were considered by your teachers to be good students? And I would hold up half a hand. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. So I was not, I was in trouble all the time. Um, I made very poor grades. Um, in sixth grade, I was the lookout outside the bathroom while my friends dealt drugs in the boys' bathroom. So like, I was on a pathway to not good things. Um, I was in the principal's office all the time, which is weird, because when I went to school, they could beat you. Um, and so like, kids today have no fear, because you can't get beaten. I got beaten a lot. And then I went home and got beat again. <laughs> and still, and still that was not enough to get through to me. Um, but my parents realized I was probably going to end up dead or in prison or both. And so they were like, you know, Eric seems to be interested in airplanes. So I tell you what, Eric, if you can just make the A, B, honor roll for one quarter, just one quarter, um, we'll get you a flight and an airplane. And I was like, done. So I made this straight A honor roll because um, it wasn't so much a question of, of, of ability as it was a question of interest. I saw no reason to go to school. I cared zero about school. I found it to be basically one step above prison. Uh, the food was pretty much in that, what I perceived to be prison area. Um, and, uh, and I was in trouble all the time. There were fights. It seemed a lot like prison, what I'd seen on TV anyway. Um, and so it's super cliche, and every time I talk to young people, I, I say this and I acknowledge it up front, but aviation literally changed my life. It changed the entire trajectory of everything that I was going to be, and it became my carrot. Normal kids that I knew got an allowance. I got an hour of flight time every month. But to do that, I had to do my chores and make good grades and not push my sister down the steps and, and stuff like that, you know, and like be a good person. I um, mean, it, it was my incentive. And so this is something that's sort of near and dear to my heart. It's one of the reasons why I do what I do for a living. If you had told 18-year-old Eric that he was going to be a college professor and run a college program one day, he would have probably said some really mean things to you. Um, and, and, yeah, and, and at that point, he probably would have been right. I, I did not set out in life to be a teacher. Where are my teachers? K-12 college, any, any professional educators in the room? Not, I'm flight instructor professional educators, too. I'm talking about like in schools, OK. So first of all, uh, hands, uh, my, my, hat, my hat is off to you all. I don't know how you put up with people like me in school. Um, I went to Rochelle's classrooms before or before Rochelle worked here, and I was like, I just don't know how you do this. It's middle school kids, and I just want to drop kick somebody. I, I don't have the patience for me as a kid I, at all. I don't. And so I, I deeply respect what you do. Um, my name, by the way, uh, is Eric Crump. Um, I run the aerospace program here at Polk State College, literally like half a mile down the road. <laughs> I'm in the southeast corner of the Lakeland Airport. Um, and, and again, that's sort of my journey to get here. In addition to being uh, the program director, I also call an aviation consultancy called Red Aviation. We build training programs and curriculum and stuff, and I know you're shocked, but a lot of that focus is on flight simulation and education, because uh, that is my other passion. If you can get a kid really interested in it, how do you make it accessible and how do you make it affordable? Well, flight simulation is the next, the next step, the next logical step in that. As I say in all of my breakout sessions that I've ever done at Migration, um, that's who I am. If, if you like what I have to say, if you don't like what I have to say, my name is Charlie Gregoire, and I'm <laughs> uh, And so if you, if you don't like it, please, when you, when you talk to Jerry or Todd, please say, Charlie was a terrible breakout presenter, and they'll, they'll know which breakout you went to. So we have a couple of things to talk about today. Um, we're going to start off with 
sort of, you know, why do we need STEM uh, in period, and then and why is aviation the perfect vehicle for that? I'm going to take you back to high school. I don't know which kid you were, or maybe you were the kid that took the picture. And, you know, everybody's high school experience is a little bit different. Um, but we're going to go back to high school, learn a little bit about high school, how high school works specifically, um, and then also talk about some realistic strategies for how uh, we can build better partnerships and increase pathway opportunities for our young people to present more options to them. So, uh, first of all, let's start with STEM and aviation. So, what is STEM? You know, it's funny because like 10 years ago you said STEM and people were like, what's that? Now, if you go somewhere and you say, what is STEM, and people don't know, it's like, like you look at them weird, like, how do you not know what STEM is? Like, we've, been, we've been talking about this non-stop, like, how do you not know about STEM? Um, some, some places we get the, the A, the arts added in there too, called STEAM, you know, that's sort of the next evolution. Um, I, I draw stick people, so I don't talk about STEAM. My art skills are not where they need to be. I'm just, we're just going to focus on the STEM part today. Um, so what we really need uh, is STEM. Uh, what, we, what we sorely need in the United States is STEM. Um, we consistently rank either sort of right dead center in the middle of the world, or in some cases a little bit behind um, in uh, math and science literacy specifically, which is kind of crazy. Um, as the most developed nation in the world with the most resources in the world that we sort of just kind of lag and languish in that middle of the pack. Um, I think we can do better, but I think part of the problem is that a lot of our students are the Eric's of the world who need a reason to learn. Look, it's not okay that you tell me it's going to be on the test. Like, I need, a, I need a reason beyond I'm going to be tested. How am I going to use this? What am I going to do with it? Specifically, when we look at um, our overall ranking around, and this is from uh, 2018, was the last date I could get uh, for the, the. This is a, 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 a survey that's done around the world on a yearly basis, but the, the results kind of come out uh, really late. This, this is a testing done of 15 year olds. And we rank 24th in science in the developed world, 38th in math, which is actually below the average line, and 24th in reading. Um, I think you're wrong. I'm sorry? I think you're wrong on math is a 10, maybe. Okay. I'm serious. Yeah, um, so we, we, have a, we have an issue, and, and those of you that teach in the classroom, um, I know that you see this, and a lot of it is not, it's like with me, it's not necessarily an ability question. I think our kids are smarter today, and I think data shows that they're smarter today than they've ever been. It's are, how are we getting that out of them? How are we helping them develop that intelligence and actually use it um, and, into something productive? Um, so when I see data like this, especially since we're talking about us here in the US specifically, I'm, I'm wondering why is it that our students don't want to um, develop and grow in STEM. This, uh, this next thing I want to show you is really interesting to me, and every time I look at it, I kind of scratch my head, it kind of blows my mind. Half of Americans say more people don't pursue STEM degrees because of the difficulty of the subjects. So specific, it's just too hard. But how, how lazy is that? I'm like, it's crazy. And you're like, really it's too hard, it's really fun. Like there, there, there's, and there's money, like don't you like money? Yeah, but it's just too hard. And part of that may be because there are just, there are other options. You know, we're, we're not living on subsistence farming. Most places in the United States where you're like, well, if I don't, you know, pull this crop in, we're not going to eat this week. You know, we're, we're, and because of that, we're like, well, you know, I could do something else and maybe it wouldn't be as hard. And I don't really want to study. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. I love those conversations with my students on a regular basis. What's interesting to me about this is not necessarily just that. It's, it's around 52% of U.S. adults in general say STEM is too hard. This is what I cannot understand this. Maybe somebody can help me. For people in, in the workforce already, people who are in STEM jobs, 60% of them say the STEM is just too hard. It's like this is what you do for a living. What do you mean it's too hard? Like my job is so tough that nobody wants to go into this job because it's hard. What did you think it was hard? Did you enjoy doing differential equations to become an engineer? I didn't, that's why I became a pilot. It, I mean, I could do it. I learned, I mean, I did Calc 3 and differential equations. And I was like, man, this is terrible. I can do this and I can make good money and I can work in engineering, but I have zero passion for this at all. I want to go fly an airplane because that's super exciting. And that definitely worked out for me in that regard. Jimmy, hand it back. 
Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm gonna twist that around on you for a second. So I can see where the two hard comes into play when you're working for like SpaceX and you have to prove yourself for the first five years of your existence and working 80 hours a week. I can see a little bit of the two hard, but right. I agree with you most likely, most definitely that in the, this is what you train to do, this is what you wanted to do when you started this. And I think a lot of it does come down to that, it's the want to, it's the passion, right? Like, do, you, do you want to do this? Because you're like, oh, flying would be cool and I can go anywhere for free and I get paid a lot and and, and I, you know, I get to see all these cool places. Yeah, but, but you're also not home a lot. You know, and you're gonna spend the first couple of years in a hotbed in Newark, New Jersey. Like, I mean, do you, do you know, do you understand like the lifestyle that to do that, to, to expend the money, to put in the work, the four to one ratio of every hour I'm in the airplane, it's four hours on my own setting. Like, the only way that's gonna work is if you want to do it. You have to want to put yourself through that. I don't know of any doctor I've ever talked to who went into med school to go through residency. Nobody, none of them were like, man, I can't wait till I'm like living in, a, in the hospital and trying to sleep in the basement in a wheelchair for two hours before I go perform open heart surgery. Like, man, I'm really looking forward to that. I've never talked to a lawyer who was like, man, I cannot wait until I get to clerk at this law firm and go get everybody's coffee and dry cleaning. I am really looking forward to that. No, no. But, but because we see the end in sight, it's okay that we go through these steps and progressions. One of the things I hate the most, how many flight instructors in the room? People have a CFI too. Okay, good. One of the things I hate when I train new CFIs and I hear them say, I ask them every in every class, why do you want to be a flight instructor? So I can get a real job. <clears throat> oh my god. Oh, it's like ripping my heart out. I'm gonna do this until I can get a real job or until I can get a good job. And I'm like, dude. You don't need to be a flight instructor. <laughs> this, is the, this would be the worst opportunity. Well, how am I supposed to get my hours? Ultimately, as soon as that comes out of their mouth, that's a guaranteed person I am not gonna hire to be a flight instructor. I don't care if you get the ticket or not. Like, you are definitely not getting a job with me because you're gonna take that, you're gonna share that to see, you're gonna be like, look, this is really hard. It's really expensive. And being a flight instructor is just awful. You're, gonna, so you just, you're, you're pushing that forward, right? Instead of the good parts, go on a message board. Pick any message board you want to about airline careers. Let's just pick on the airline pilots for a second. You got some salty old man, 60 years old. I'm not making fun of people who are 60 years old. I'm just saying the super salty, making 350 a year, talking about how much they hate their life. Okay, well maybe that person probably wasn't cut out to be an airline pilot in the first place. Like, that's a lifestyle decision. You know, there are other things you could do. Like, I didn't go to flight school to become a college professor. I went to flight school to be an airline pilot. And then I realized, I don't want to live that way. That's not for me. <laughs> I got into flight instruction because I taught a ground school class. And I was like, I actually kind of enjoyed that. I think maybe I could do this. And I started teaching. And it was like, wow. Again, 18-year-old Eric did not know he was going to run a college program. That was not even in my horizon. I was like, how do I get out of school as quickly as possible? And now I live in school. Like, it's literally all I do is train people all the time. It's a, it's a role reversal, but it's, it's a passion for me, and I enjoy it. And so when I hear people say, it's just too hard, look at this college grad number. People who went through a college preparation program and graduate, maybe you got a post-secondary degree. Why don't we go into STEM? 63% said because it's just too hard. Well, I mean, I think we probably need to qualify what too hard means. Why is it too hard? Well, probably because you don't know who you're teaching. Probably because you want to teach other people the way you taught or the way you like to learn. I just did learning styles with my CFI class literally yesterday. And we profiled them. You're a visual learner, you're an auditory learner. Like, what, how do you, you're a tactile learner. And they're super excited, they're like, yeah, so now I know, a guy like to learn in a tactile fashion, like, that's great, doesn't matter. Because your student's a visual learner. Well, but that's all I, well then you don't need to be a flight instructor. Maybe you need to learn how to, like, it doesn't matter how you learn. It's good that you know that now. It's like it's the bait and switch. They think they're learning something that they're gonna use. I'm like, now, forget all of that, it doesn't matter. All that matters is your learner. How do they need to learn? So. The biggest issue I'm dealing with, my teachers, maybe this isn't you, maybe it is, flight instructors, depending on what you do, the biggest issue I deal with is trying to reach Gen Z kids. It's trying to cross over, I, I'm in that gray area between Gen X and the Millennials. Like, 
I remember like dad saying, hey, go change the channel to six. And I had to run up there and grab the knob and turn the knob, right? I was the remote. That's why you had kids, I think. So that somebody could go change the channel for you. Like I remember when we had 12 total channels and we're like, who could possibly watch 12 channels? This is so much better than three. You know, I, I, I grew up before all of that. I didn't, I didn't have a cell phone until I was 18. And I, I saw these people carrying cell phones and I was like, one day I'm going to make it in life, and I'm going to have a cell phone. So four-year-olds walking around like, <laughs> I mean, I was like, it just, it's so very different. And I can't identify with it. It's very difficult. Read chapter one. They won't do it. They won't do it. Why won't you read chapter? Because they just won't. Just get over it. Accept it. <laughs> they're not, it's too hard. <laughs> it's too hard. They're not, they're not going to do it. It's going to be on the test. Okay, I'll fail the test. I just, I don't care. I refuse to read chapter one. So we have to find a way to get to these kids. Now here's the interesting thing about this. And if you teach them or have taught them, you already know this. Um, well, this is when they were born. They're super smart. They're crazy smart. They're, 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 they're smart in, in, a, in a like super like meta cognitive level that like we weren't. We're just like, is the oven hot? Yep, okay, well, I'm not going to touch it again. These kids are like, so the oven is made out of this, like, 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 I'm deconstructing the concept of the oven in my mind. I'm like, no, 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 is it hot or it's not hot? You just don't touch it. Like, it's, it's simple. Nothing is simple. Everything's complicated. Both of, my, both of my older daughters had a surprise kid two years ago. I don't know what generation he's growing up in, but, but my daughters are Gen Z kids. And, and it was super weird to, like, like, my daughter is super verbal. Like, she is so intelligent. But she's a great artist. I was like, no, no, no. You either have to be left or right brain. You can't be both. You can't be analytical and artistic. That's impossible. But they are. They, 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 they're, they're so... They're, they're, they're intelligent in a well-rounded way that I am not. <laughs> I'm just absolutely... It's not in my wheelhouse. Also, when they go to work... They're always connected to something. You're like, oh, I don't know when they're at work. And they're walking around. They walk out on the street with a phone in their hand. Yeah, I mean, that, that's true, too. They, they definitely do that. But they have a, a need for connection with their peers, they, with mentorship. More than the, the millennials were told they were special and that they were the best. So they don't really like mentorship. It's kind of like, no, I'm already good. I don't need your opinion, old man. Um, but the Gen Z kids, they grew up hearing... Like all of the, like they grew up with all of this information and all of these people who did this stuff, and so they, 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 they wanted to make comments. They wanted people to comment on their stuff. They get really hurt when people say mean things about them on social media, and and they're they're trying to find meaningful connections because all of their connections are digital, and then they meet a human being and they're like, hi, hi. Can we talk? Can we be friends? It gets weird. It's like it's like sixth graders at the dance. You know, they're just like. <laughs> um, but man, on social media, like I've got this great life, and here's me flying my drone, and all. I mean, but but in person, they're just they 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 crave that connection. They also think globally and visually. They 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 don't have any problem with the fifty thousand foot view. Actually, sometimes they focus way too big. It's like, hmm. No, let's. This is, this is the lesson today. And we're going to get to that like four years from now. But <laughs> today, we need to cover this. And as educators, it's our responsibility not to quash that and be like, hey, sit down and shut up. We're going to get to that in four years. It's finding a way to, to redirect and, and keep them in the moment, but also keep their love and their passion alive so we don't lose them to something else. When they go to school... They crave, I would say they even maybe demand technology, technology enabled learning. I'll go about more about that in a second. But they absolutely demand intensive experiences and connections with content. Read chapter one. I think as, as established professionals, educators, whatever, we go, well, you won't read because you're lazy. No, they won't read because it's boring. They, 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 were, they were handed an iPad when they were babies, and they learned they learned tactile skills, they learned hand-eye coordination. Like you had to go to school and get hit with the dodgeball. No, I need to move out of the way. They they just that's instinctual for them. Like they grow up with a spatial awareness that you and I didn't have until we fell off the bike. 
They've already watched 400 hours of videos on YouTube about how to ride the bike. They just need to feel that you're there and like, but don't overdo it because they've already watched like their favorite influencers ride a bike. Like they just need you to like, yeah, you're doing, okay, yeah, oh, okay, that's it. <laughs> they, 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 need, they need shepherding, they definitely need mentorship, but they crave intense learning experiences. Read chapter one won't work. So we have to come up with something that's more interactive, more hands-on, something that's more tactile. Is any of this ringing a bell? Does it sound like something maybe we have access to? Okay, just like, I wonder what we could do, Eric. Well, I, I think the easiest thing we could do is probably like use aviation, okay? Because aviation is all the stems. It's all the things. It, it, pulls, it pulls everything together. In order to do it right, uh, we have to be very attentive to the environment, to what we're doing to um, constantly new, ever-evolving technologies. And aviation in general is a team sport. I tell all my egomaniacal type A pilot applicants all the time, they're like, yeah, man, I got my private certificate. Like, okay, that's, that's awesome, Clint Eastwood, but <laughs> here's the deal, like, <laughs> that's great, and I'm super proud of you. But for every two of those people in the front of the airline that you aspire to be, like, I wanna be that guy. I want to be one of those two. For every two people in the front, it takes 100 people to get you there. You're, you are the minority population. Like if that ramp agent doesn't load your airplane, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> and it is so funny um, how, how myopic we can be in this industry. I'm a pilot. Okay, that's fine. Or uh, I'm, I'm a, a maintenance technician. And I think part of the reasons we have such a huge personnel supply issue is because we only see ourselves as the job we do, not the ambassador for the job we do. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, maybe this is only my experience, but like when I was a kid and I had to go to the doctor, I just thought it was so cool that this person like walks in this room, he's got on this white coat, he hands me a lollipop, like, I'm really liking this relationship we have. <laughs> I respected him. Why? Because I, I could even read the diploma of what medical school he went to? No. It didn't matter. My mom took me to that doctor, and I know my mom is trying to keep me alive, so I respected that person just because I was associated with that person. If you're a flight instructor and you, you believe that your role in this industry is to sit in an airplane and teach somebody how to fly, I think we're missing the boat. Because those people chose to come and fly with you. The, all, how many people are not pilots? The vast majority of the population. Where are they at? Shopping malls, maybe not so much anymore. Um, they're in school, right? I have yet, to, and Elizabeth and your team probably know better than me, but I have yet to talk to a CT director anywhere in the country where you're like, hey, listen, if an airline pilot or anybody called you and said, hey, can I come talk to your class? Would you tell them no? Like, absolutely not. I would, I would want the contact number for five of their friends so I could invite them to talk. It's, it's not like it's hard, but we have to take the content to that. I really do believe that if we can show this population, the excitement, the enthusiasm. I mean, you can talk about money if you want to. Everybody, like, you go talk about a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, someone like, oh, cool, yeah. But I don't really lead with that. I talk about the stuff that they care about intense experiences. They care about seeing new places. I, actually, when I talk to high school students, and especially middle school students, I don't mention the money. They're gonna ask that in the Q&A session at the end. It doesn't even matter, just leave that out. I'm like, hey, so you wake up this morning and you feel like, you know what, I'd like to eat lunch in Paris. How cool would it be if you could do that? Like, oh, that sounds cool. Like, that's it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm selling an experience. I'm selling a lifestyle. And they're like, that sounds really cool. How would you like it? Not only if you could do that, but you could take your whole family. Like, you know what, let's just go on a vacation this weekend. I would love to do that. Especially right now, they're already stuck at home forever. They're like, yeah, sign me up for that job. How do I do that? Aviation is the perfect STEM vehicle for these kids. Well, I think we all know this stuff. You know, when we look at all the stuff that aviation can be, whether it's, you know, flight test processes and engineering, or even understanding 
um, basic uh, weather patterns and earth science. I mean, like all of these things clue in. Um, and I don't want to oversell this because I'm going to get to it at the end. So stand by and I'm also trying to be aware of the fact that I told you you'd get out on time and you will. But aviation goes beyond STEM too. So did you learn geography in high school? I did. It was a lot of fun. I also I went to school in Alabama. I know that's crazy to you. They're like, they have schools in Alabama? Yes, they do. Um, we just got shoes like two weeks ago. We're very excited about it. Um, I also took Alabama history. There's a lot of really cool aviation history in Alabama that I had no idea about. And I got to do this really cool thing where I went back to the school district where I went to school and got to go into a classroom and talk about Alabama's aviation history in the Alabama history class. <coughs> this, it, goes, it goes beyond just the science, technology, engineering, math. That's great, but it also connects in other ways for sure. Now let's talk about high school for a second. So if you want to graduate from high school, uh, actually, if you haven't graduated now, we can talk about that later. Um, but if you meet some kids or you know some kids who want to graduate from high school, you need about 20 to 25 credits for units of content. Now it depends on what state and all sorts of other things. And so how is that, how is that broken up? Well, you got all the usual stuff that you're prepared for, that you are already aware of, and also some electives. And those electives can be stuff like, um, I don't know, a business class, economics class, all sorts of things that you can cover. Well, I mean, when we look at how are those credits determined, in general, a credit or a unit of instruction is 150 total hours, or if you want to think about it, a year, okay? So that's broken down into two semesters, four quarters, depending on your school district and how they do all that. So where does that go? Well, when we get into electives, um, we've got foreign languages, we've got art, but all kinds of cool things. But I'm not aware of a school district, I, I'm, maybe they exist, I'm not aware of a school district in the United States that does not offer some form of career and technical education. That, I didn't realize that's what it was, but that was available when I was in high school. It was called VOTEC, and you would go, you went to school, like with everybody else, and then you went to another place and you learned small engine repair, or you learned whatever, like that was always there, I just didn't know that's what it was. I, I didn't know that was a thing. All right, so when we look at the elective credits that a student has to fill up that bucket of stuff outside of the general education requirements got a high school, career and technical education can satisfy, in some cases, all of those things. Well, hold on, I'm coming across. Okay, the cool thing about the way career and technical education works is that there are curriculum frameworks and they call them different things, and they work in different ways, that can provide a single elective credit or an entire program. Like, for example, all of you at this point have seen Central Florida Aerospace Academy across the street. It's a standalone aviation high school. You can go there and take algebra and world history and become an aviation mechanic. Okay, so it's a standalone thing that does its own thing. And of the five programs that are offered over there, they all exist in a four-year CTE framework. So all of your electives are already mapped out for you. You're gonna take general education type stuff, but then you're gonna fill all those gaps in with aviation-y things, whether it's maintenance or flying an airplane or uh, engineering or drones or whatever it is, all that's scripted out. So it makes it super easy for the parent to understand this is what my student is going to go to school and do, okay? It's not just sort of thrown together and these, these frameworks already exist and they focus on industry credentials. I don't know if you've looked at aviation, but we are pretty high up in the rich category on industry credentials. There's a whole bunch of them. I mean, at least in Florida and some other states too, those credentials are incentivized. So if you go over to Central Florida Aerospace Academy and you take the private pilot ground school class and you pass it, the school gets money for that. If you go take the UAVSI drone safety certificate and you pass it, the school gets money for that. That's how they fund equipment. That's additional, that's additional dollars outside of their district allotment. They can invest back into their programs. So yeah, schools love, love CT because it's a funding mechanism. It's a way to get money. All right? And who pays the money? The state. It comes from the state. In Florida, it comes from the Department of Education. It's a, it's a grant. 
Um, and again, every I'm trying not to be overly specific because I everything I do is here. So, I, but I having worked with a lot of other people, actually, if you want to know how this really works, just talk to Elizabeth because she knows way more about this than I do. We can talk about intro to aviation, a simple course. We could talk about a full-on private pilot ground school, maybe a part 107 course to get your 107 cert to fly drones. There's all sorts of different things. And when we get outside of just looking at the aviation high school classroom, there's also opportunities for dual enrollment with colleges like ours. If you go to Central Florida Aerospace Academy, you can leave that with basically the first year of college done for free, by the way, and your private pilot certificate funded through Rochelle's really awesome scholarship program. Okay, now, I, I talk to a lot of people about what we do here, and they're like, yeah, but that's, yeah, you guys have this, no, no, this didn't just happen. And it certainly was not like a light switch. This has been an ongoing thing for decades. And it wasn't like one person was like, this is how it's gonna be. It was a whole bunch of people coming together and saying, how do we get to kids who are eight, nine, 10 years old inspire them but then provide them what's the next step so you did a young eagles ride great what are you gonna do next like what's the next step and then what's the next step after that how do i get you in an airplane to get a certificate and then when i'm doing that how am i incentivizing you to keep going because here's the job right here's the outcome okay how am i doing oh, i can totally do this this is the point of the class where my students are like looking at the clock on the wall and they're like, there's no way he's going to make it. And I'm like, oh, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. This thing, on. we're going to do it for sure. So now how do I do this? This was not originally part of my spiel. Um, what happened, like I have two meetings this week with other state colleges in Florida who want to start aviation programs. And Generally speaking, when that happens, when I get that initial contact, it, it comes from somebody at the college and I'm always, I, the other person that's on that meeting invite is the flight school that went to the college and said, let's start a program together. And I'm, well, yeah, that's partnership. Maybe it is. But in a lot of cases, and I realize I'm talking to a lot of flight instructors and flight schools out here, if your motivation of going to work with your college or high school partner is guaranteed influx of students and financial aid, man, we're going to get rich. Nope. <laughs> not. The level, if you think working with your students right now is stressful, what they're trying to come up with the money to pay and it's whatever, let me tell you something. Working with college programs is like 40 gazillion times harder and more stressful and you think they're getting money but they don't. And then, like you, you have to want to do this because you realize it's moving the needle, right? That, that there is some, are you gonna make some money and have a guaranteed stream of students? Yes, but like I tell my, my pilots, if you're starting this career path because you want to make a lot of money, you need to rethink why you're doing this. But you will, but there's no guarantee you're going to like it or be happy at doing it. I'm still blown away by the number of people who come into my office who say, I want to be a pilot. Sign me up for classes. I'm like, cool. So, do you have any prior flight experience? Nope. You ever like been in a small airplane? Nope. You ever flown commercially? Nope. Like, are you being serious right now? Like, do you know how much this costs? You want to like spend all this money? You don't even know what it is. No, I won't enroll you in anything until you go to a discovery flight. I'm not willing to take your money. I'm not willing to sign you up. I'm not willing to go through all this trouble with you to get your financial aid until you <laughs> figure out if you actually like this or not. Now, I don't know about you, but I have yet to see anybody get out of an airplane and go, eh. I mean, it's like they're either like, this is the coolest day of my life, or I hate this, I was terrified the entire time, and I just want to curl in a ball and cry. Like, it's one of those two extremes. I have yet to see anybody go, I mean, you know, it was okay. Like, that's not happened to me, maybe it's happened to you. Okay? So, it's a really powerful motivator. But look at this, what, what do you want to do? What, what do you really want to gain from this? I'm not, like I tell my flight instructors, it's okay to build hours and make some money. That's okay. That can be a motivation, but it can't be your only motivation. Because after the 20th time you do lesson four, you're going to want to kill somebody. There's only a certain amount of times you can do steep turns and say, altitude, 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 altitude. Before you just like, I'm opening the door. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
there has to be some kind, you have to get some kind of intrinsic motivation from watching that light bulb come on over somebody's head. And if, if that's you, then flight instruction is going to work out for you. You're in Florida, man. It's hot. It's real hot. you got to get to like 6,000 feet in July to be able to breathe. I mean, you know, and everybody stinks. Like, you got to really want to do this. Um, and it's the same thing for flight schools. Why do you want to do this? And do you have the people for it? Bob sort of talked about this before, having the right connections with customers. You know, do you, do you have the people who, who are willing and able to field these questions? Gen Z kids ask a lot of questions. Millennials didn't because they knew everything already. But the Gen Z kids, I'm just, I'm just spitting the truth. I mean, my truth. That's my experience. But Gen Z kids are like, so how do I fly 747? <laughs> uh, can, can you take me flying? Can we go flying right now? No, we can't. Not right now. Like, can you wait till the end of this particular session? And again, how do we do that without crushing your dreams? <laughs> and and, and I'll, I'll tell you that part of that has been just asking them, what do you want? <laughs> what do you want? And you know what they, you know what they say? Do you want to hang out? Just socialize. You know, I have seen more growth from my students from doing Friday lunches. Where we just, like if you're in the building, we just go out and eat food. They grow more, they build connections. And then I'm walking to the flight school and I've got like 12 kids in a room doing cooperative ground together. Like they, somebody's got a dry erase marker and they're going through aviation acronyms. And I'm like, I didn't even tell you to do that. I didn't even tell you you should do that. You just figured it out on your own. Just a little bit of guidance. And then, you know, every once in a while check in and make sure they're not you know, doing something crazy. But I mean, it really, it takes a little bit of mentorship. Do you have the people for that? You have people who want to do that, who want to mentor, who want to help kids grow. Um, so, let's see. Are you my timekeeper, Harmony? Yep. Okay. I do. So, really, really super practically, um, if you are a flight school and you're like, you know, how do I start this relationship with my local high school or, or my local college? To me, there's, there's two paths. If you know somebody there, aviation is a networking business. I don't know if you knew that or not. Work you're in, okay? Let's let's start there. You have again, maybe start there. Having that connection on the inside can help because just as much as the district administrator doesn't know anything about aviation, you don't know anything about how to run a high school. So accept that and accept that we're we're coming to this as partners. I'm not coming to you and being like, listen, you're going to do what I tell you because I've got the airplanes. <laughs> well, but they've got the students, so you know maybe maybe we're in this together. Or maybe I'm being crazy, but. You know, let's let's work it together. If you don't have the end, it's usually pretty simple. I'm assuming your school district probably has a website. Not in Alabama, but everywhere at Mississippi, maybe. <laughs> but Alabama is it's hit or miss. The, sorry. The 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 state motto for Alabama is "Thank you for Mississippi" because y'all are 50th and everything, and we're 49th. So um, that's 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 how we live our lives. Go to the website. Figure out who your CT director is. Start there. Phone call. Email. Maybe you know somebody who knows that person. That's the person you need to talk to. Everybody wants to go to the school principal. And I love school principals, don't get me wrong. I have a lot of friends who are school principals. They are just trying to hang on for dear life. They're just, especially right now, they're just trying to make sure there's a teacher in a classroom. Like, it's not that they don't want to talk to you, it's they just don't have the bandwidth for it. Don't go there. Like, I'm just going to go stalk the principal's office. They got enough problems. Go, go, go to career and technical education. Start there because they already speak some of your language. They're, they already know if they have a framework already, if they're going to have to build one or modify one, start there and then work your way in. That's really what the rest of that says. Um, sorry. I'm, how am I doing, Hardy? Where am I at? Am I on time? 30 seconds past. What? No, I'm not. It says. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm 30 seconds past. Okay, okay, listen, listen, we're still within, we're within an acceptable margin. Stroke free. Rose final stand. Two things from this, don't try to overdo it. I talked to a lot of high schools who were like, man, we're gonna, we're gonna get a kit project and build a plane and we're gonna have an after school flying club. And you, yes, you can totally go there, but the, there's, there is zero bandwidth to just Let's do everything. 
I talked to a lot of flight schools who are like, you know what, it's time, I'm gonna do it. I'm going the part 141 route. Um, FA, here's private, instrument, commercial, multi, just CFI, double I, here, take it. And this FA's like, dude, no, 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 no. Give me private, give me one. Let's, let's get you real deal and then we can add on more stuff. Don't, don't overshoot it. Um, and maybe most importantly, understand that you're not in it alone. Um, my really good friends over here wearing the AFK shirts um, have done a lot of the legwork for you. Um, you know, the, if I could have gone to a high school like that, I would have wanted to go to that school. Um, and I talked to a lot of those kids and the, the unifying theme, we're actually starting our second aviation academy in Polk County. They get their official campus starting in August. The unifying theme when I'm talking to these kids is, I actually really enjoyed coming to school. I liked that. I'm like, you're so weird. <laughs> what? Yeah. But I would have enjoyed that too. That would have given me a reason to learn. And so a lot of schools are like, well, that sounds really cool, but well, it sounds like a lot of work and we got all this stuff going on. Well, I mean, how cool would it be if you could just be like, no, don't worry about that. I got a whole curriculum for you right here. This right here. It's in a box. Like, take this. Well, we don't have anybody on staff that's a pilot. Also doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, do you know off the top of your head, just percentage-wise, how many of your teachers are actually certified pilots? I would say 20% of us. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so, like that, that, I hear that a lot. Like, well, we gotta go find a staff member, we gotta hire a pilot faculty member. How do we even credential that person? You don't. Go find a math teacher who wants a, a, something to help their kids learn math. Aviation will do that. <laughs> And so that's there. Anybody in here? I, I said, who's educators again? Uh, K-12? Okay. So um, just a quick tease, and then I promise I'll let you go. Really soon, you will see an email, and it will excite you, and you'll go, this is the email Eric was talking about. So again, a little shameless advertising because they invited me to speak. Redbird obviously creates hardware and would love to sell that hardware to your schools, okay? I mean, they'd love to do that. And I think a lot of teachers, they see that money, the grant money, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna go buy a bunch of simulators. They have no idea what to do with them. Like, well, what do I do with this? I've got this equipment, but I don't know how to use it. So in the very near future, you're gonna see a simulation supplement come out from Redbird that is an augment to the really spectacular curriculum at AOPA which takes that, the classroom learning, the presentations, the worksheets, all of that, and you know, gives it like a big steroid shot and says, here's 70 more simulation extension activities that you can put your kids together with and say, all right, we talked about weight and balance. Now jump in the sim and load up this airplane and see why it won't take off. We can, we can visualize it, right? I, not just visualize it, but I can also put my hands on it. We're using all those different learning domains, right? Because that's what those kids want. And that's where it's at, guys. If you want to go into the high school and be like, come to my flight school and learn to be a pilot, that's cool. And some kids will probably show up. But how are you, how are you going to treat them differently than the normal person who walks in off the street who's making a six-figure income who's like, yeah, I don't mind dropping this money. I want to learn how to fly. I want to fly one time a month for the next five years before I become a private pilot. You know, that, that kid's not in that same boat. Do you, are you ready to work with that student? So don't just rush to the high school and be like, come to us, are you, are you ready? Because if you do that, especially today, there's a high likelihood that a bunch of those kids are gonna show up. Is your existing customer base gonna be okay with a bunch of 14 year olds running around your flight school? I don't know, but if you, if you wanna go there, I'm telling you, you're never gonna find a more willing group to learn who really want something to do with their life but they're really looking for something because they've seen other people doing it and if you do it right you can be that somebody oh it's a heartwarming story <laughs> listen I, like i i can tell you stories uh, about teachers like i remember i remember who they were i can still see them in my mind because they made such an impression on me they gave me a reason to learn you can be that somebody for somebody like you can look back and go Man, look at these kids. Like I, I remember when they came through my flight school and now they're a triple seven captain. Like I mean, I don't know about you. Maybe you don't get any reward out of life, but that's super rewarding to me. When I see that success, I'm like, man, 
It just requires a pathway, and we can do that, but I, and the, the, the punchline is we have to do it together. High schools want those kids to graduate. The best way to get them to graduate is to give them a reason to come to school. You can be the reason for them to come to school. And yes, then your aircraft have more utilization. So do your simulators, so do your flight instructors. See how everybody wins in this? It's a very symbiotic type thing. Thank you so much for paying attention. Thank you. Now that I've worked on all the kings, come back and live.